Genius back with you once again, and I wanted to take a moment or two to expand a little bit on a point I made in our last presentation. Uh, you may recall that I made the statement uh, last week uh, in, in uh, reference to our debt ceiling debate and all the posturing that's going on in Washington and, and all of that. I made the statement that we in this country do not have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. But even more important, and more importantly than the spending problem, more critically than the, than the spending problem, we have a government problem in this country. Now, I didn't really expand on that uh, very much uh, last week. I kind of uh, stuck to the scare tactics that the left are using in terms of this debate, and, and we didn't really get to expand on that much. But I wanted to take a moment today uh, to talk about that a little bit more, because I think it's a critical part of this debt ceiling debate and the overall debate on our fiscal issues that, that's really missing. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, last week and a half since our last presentation, as this debate has worn on and we've had meeting after meeting after meeting and uh, Obama's come out with a, another press conference every day, you know, threatening people or whatever he's doing, I've noticed something kind of interesting. The Democrats have continued the same thing they were doing all along, the scare tactics and the laser-like focus on raising taxes on the wealthy. At the expense of everything else, it seems like that's the only objective that the left has in this whole situation. And on the other hand, the Republicans who are involved, well, they seem to be pretty well focused on cutting spending, but you don't really see them talking about doing much more than that. And don't get me wrong, it's great that they're focused on cutting spending, I'm all for that. But we don't hear too many Republicans really taking that next step and actually questioning the legitimacy of some of the programs, the government programs that we have in place. And I think that that brings up something that, that we really need to talk about and that really needs to enter the debate in this country. It's something that I think a lot of people will not say, but that a lot of us are actually thinking. I guess a lot of Republican politicians won't say it because they're afraid they might lose some voters or, you know, piss off a couple constituents or get a bad op-ed piece in some newspaper somewhere. But, hey, I told you guys from day one, I don't have political office, I'm not running for anything, I've got nothing to lose, so I can tell you the truth. I can actually cut to the chase. So, the statement I want to make, and the statement that I think needs to be brought into the debt ceiling debate and all of the fiscal issues uh, and the debate on those things that we have in this nation, and indeed all of politics in general, the statement I would like to bring into that, that I would like to examine, is this. I do not believe that government should be in the role of allocating, facilitating, or manipulating society. Now, what do I mean by that? That, that was kind of wordy. That, that kind of sounded like a Dr. Seuss book, so uh, let, let's talk about that a little bit more. What do I mean when I'm talking about allocating, facilitating, or manipulating society? Well, let's look at each of those individually. Allocating. Well, by that I'm talking about uh, the government's involvement in, in implementing social programs and uh, the progressive taxation and using the tax code to, to take resources from one American and give them to another American for whatever reason. Or to take money from business and give it to somebody else. The idea that government can better allocate the resources that we have better than we can. The idea that the resources that are out there, that, that all of us have whatever resources I have, whatever resources you have, whatever resources the guy over here has, or whatever resource the business over, over there has, that all of those resources really don't belong to us individually, but actually they really belong to all of us as a collective, and it's the government's role to best figure out how to allocate those resources among us. I don't believe that should be a role of government. And furthermore, I believe a lot of the government programs that are in place that Obama is so hell-bent on funding do just that. When I say facilitating society, what do I mean? I'm talking about the regulatory end of government. I'm talking about the idea that government is somehow qualified to tell us what kind of light bulbs we can use, what type of food we should eat, what type of food can be offered to us at a restaurant, whether or not we can smoke in a, in a restaurant somewhere, uh, or, or in terms of business, determining how a business should run, determining what businesses should offer to people. Determining what they should not offer. Cafe standards on cars. Things like uh, minimum uh, mileage requirements and gas requirements for cars. Why should the government be telling the car industry 
what they can and can't sell. Oh wait, they own a couple of companies, I guess that's why. But you get the point. The government, by means of facilitating society, by means of regulating society, is coming in and trying to tell people how best they can run their lives and run their businesses, instead of allowing the interaction of human beings and the free markets actually determine that themselves. Think about something. You probably heard a story earlier this week down in Georgia. A couple of little girls had a lemonade stand. They're raising some money to go to a water park or something. And a police officer comes along and instead of uh, getting out of his patrol car, putting down a quarter, taking a couple of lemonade and patting them on the head and saying, good job, he tells the young ladies that they need to shut down their stand because they don't have the proper permits and licenses and he doesn't know what's in the lemonade. Are you kidding? Do, do we really need government doing that? Is that really what we need government to regulate? Think of another example. One of the, one of the great thinkers and, and economists of our time, Walter E. Williams, you've heard me talk about him before. When he speaks and when he writes, he often uses an example and a little story. Let's say that you are someone who is unemployed. And hey, right now, some of you probably are unemployed. Let's say you're unemployed. And you get the idea that, hey, you know, I'm unemployed, I don't have a job, I'm up this morning, i got to do something, so hey, I've got a car, why don't I put a little sign in the car that says taxi, and maybe I can drive around town and, you know, maybe for a, for a fee, pick up some people and, and take them to various places and make a little money that way. Makes sense to me, right? Oh, wait, in most cities, you cannot do that because you have to get licensed for a taxi, and you have to go through this, the, the different hoops that you have to jump through for government. In fact, I believe in New York City, it costs at least $10,000 just to get a taxi license. Do we really need the government regulating that? I don't believe we do. But yet so many of the government programs, so many of the things that the left wants to fund, come down to regulating our businesses, regulating our individual lives, and telling us what we should do, facilitating how we live our lives and how business operates. And then finally, manipulate. What do I mean when I say government manipulates society? I'm talking about the constant pursuit by government of ensuring fair outcomes for people and ensuring equality and fairness and such high-minded concepts. They do this through a variety of ways, grants and education and scholarships and things like that, loans, that sort of thing, disproportionate spending, you know, throwing a bunch more money at inner city schools than rural schools get to much lesser in the way of results, I might add. Remember that Community Reinvestment Act? You know, that, that thing that caused the financial meltdown we just had? You know, the, the deal where uh, the government essentially told the banks, hey, you know those uh, non-credit worthy people over there who uh, don't have the credit to be able to get a house and really have not shown any sort of ability to pay a, a house note? you got to start loaning to them now. So they force the banks to take on all this additional risk. And the banks, okay, maybe they got a little bit over aggressive and they sold off that risk to other suckers, I mean people that would buy it, because hey, what does that bank want that risk for? The government basically put them in the system and made them do that. And the result was the financial meltdown we have today. That's a very short explanation for it, but we all know what happened. But nevertheless, the idea that the government can somehow manipulate fair outcomes better than the free market can do it, or better than our individual interactions with each other can do it. That's an awful lot, an awful lot, of what the government spends our money on. Now, that's what I mean when I say the government should not allocate, facilitate, or manipulate society. I don't believe the government has very much business in any of those three areas. Now, I know that's a big phrase, I know it's a lot to get your, your head around, Another way you can look at it is this. When the government undertakes the role of trying to cure the ills of human society, when, trying, when the government undertakes the notion that somehow it can overcome all of the negative factors of human existence and eliminate them, at that point the government is barking up their own tree. Now, our friends on the left will continuously debate that point with us, and they always have for decades upon decades, they probably always will, they believe that government can and does take a substantial role in the improvement of society 
Many of us believe just the opposite, that government is an impediment to the improvement of society. However, setting the, the debate aside of whether or not government can accomplish such a high-minded goal, let's look at the last 50, 60, 70, 100 years. I think we all would acknowledge that in the last century, at least the majority of it, those on the left and even a few people on the right have undertaken the idea of a more aggressive federal government, of a more involved federal government, of a federal government that does have some sort of role in uh, allocating resources or uh, facilitating certain things in society or manipulating certain outcomes even. A lot of people believe in that, and it's not just Democrats. I mean, sure, the Democrats are the biggest proponents of it, from your Woodrow Wilsons to your FDRs to your Barack Obamas, but hey, even, even Republicans like Richard Nixon and his price controls and <laughs> forming the EPA, well, that was a mistake. And your George W. Bush with his compassionate conservatism, even some of them got caught up in it. The idea that government can somehow better facilitate our lives and better facilitate our society than we can. So that idea has been out there for quite a while, but we should ask the question, looking back in the last 75 years, since that idea of government as a significant factor in our society, as that idea has taken hold and taken root and been implemented, has it really accomplished the goals that they stated they had? Has it really improved the situation? Well, we've seen law after law and program after program that were supposed to eliminate poverty. From the New Deal to the Great Society to yep, that old Community Reinvestment Act, good old Barney Frank's handy work there. So all of those things, all the welfare programs, all the Medicare, all of that, it was supposed to eliminate poverty or at least put a significant dent in it. Did that happen? Look around you. No, it did not. You can drive to your average in the inner city now or even some rural areas and see poverty that's just as bad or worse as it was earlier in the century. So all of those government programs, all of those wars on poverty, all of that money that was spent, all of that income that was confiscated from one group of people and given to another group of people really didn't do a damn thing. Has government facilitation and oversight helped the way that business runs? <laughs> I can't say that it has. Prices certainly aren't down. In fact, most businesses now have such onerous regulations that so much of what they charge you for an item is wrapped up in adhering to those government regulations. My goodness, how, how much money has been wasted on environmental regulations over the years? Money that is paid by these companies and these, these uh, manufacturers, but it's passed on to you and I, the consumer. Are we really better off for that? I don't see where we are. And for all the government manipulation of outcomes, are we all on an equal plane financially? Not that we should want to be, but since that's evidently what a lot of people in the government want, is, or is that where we are? No. So for all of the pursuit of an active government that would overcome all the ills of society, why has it not worked? I'll tell you why it hasn't worked. The reason it has not worked is because human beings are imperfect. I know that's a shock, isn't it? Human beings are flawed. And therefore, any government set up by human beings, any government facilitated or, or executed by human beings will also be flawed, also be imperfect. In other words, you cannot overcome the ills of human society by using a structure put into place by human beings. Now, does that mean I want aliens to come down here and run at me? No, of course not. But what I'm telling you is that we have always lived and always will live with the consequences of human imperfection. And rather than trying to chase some high-minded and impossible goal, of eliminating the results of human imperfection. Instead, we should best strive on an individual basis to overcome those things within our own life. We should be less worried about what society is doing in that regard or what government is doing to overcome those, those uh, bad things which they cannot overcome. And instead, focus on that in our own lives. And get the government out of the business of trying to run society 
It's proven woefully inadequate in doing so. And frankly, it's taking an awful lot of our money to try and maintain that failed structure. How much money could we save? How much less money could we spend if government were not worried about and not focused on correcting the ills of society, which it cannot succeed in? The bottom line is human beings cannot fix the ills of human society. No civilization before us has succeeded in it. No civilization after us will succeed in it. You know, I was reading something the other day, a little book called The Politically Incorrect Guide to Western Civilizations. It's by a gentleman named Anthony Esselin. Well, Mr. Esselin puts it into words better than I could, and probably better than I did. Let me quote from his book here. It's a problem that the politically correct have not caught up with, as they continue, long after anybody has really believed in it, to press for the perfect society, the perfectly happy man, males and females perfectly the same, children perfectly wise, and old people perfectly childlike and pliable. It's enough to make one laugh as he picks his way through the ruins. People cheat, steal, brawl, and idle their hours away. Well, some people have always done things like that. Christians called it our propensity to sin, but that explanation won't do if you have rejected the whole idea of sin. Then it must be that some vague thing called society has made us so, or our upbringing. We're socially constructed. That's what the politically correct social scientists tell us, generally exempting themselves from the diagnosis. All we need then is to rig up that right technology of government and education to fix that mistake. And who will run these vast programs? We know who. People who cheat, steal, brawl, and idle their hours away. In other words, those in government who we supposedly entrust to overcome the ills of society are no different than any of us. The same flaws, the same weaknesses, and so there's no reason to believe or trust that they could better facilitate, allocate, or manipulate our lives better than we could as individuals. That's what this whole debate comes down to. It's what really almost every political debate in this country boils down to. I remember one time hearing an old uh, Milton Friedman debate. It was an appearance on a Phil Donahue show. And Phil Donahue, who was a huge liberal back in the 70s and 80s, he was going off and, well, don't we need government to do this and ensure that and regulate this and oversee that? And Friedman responded to him, where, all, where are all these angels that you're going to get to run everything? He was dead on. The angels don't exist. And the government cannot play the part of the angels. Government can and should do some very specific things. Protect our borders. Provide police protection. Protect property rights. That sort of thing. Beyond that, there's not much more. Government should not be in the role of pursuing the perfect society because government is woefully inadequate to do so. It cannot. It's a human structure. It was formed by humans and it's no different than us. And that's that's the same whether we're talking about liberals being in charge, conservatives being in charge, Republicans, Democrats, whatever. No government created by man can cure the ills that were also created by man. It simply cannot happen. So there's your food for thought for this week. That is something to keep in the back of your mind when all of this debate ceiling stuff continues hitting the fan. Do we really need to do government to do the majority of things that it's doing and that they're telling us we need to fund? I don't think so. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next week.